For both of us, our practice day in and day out is, is patents. I mean, we are intellectual property attorneys, but both of us specialize in that area. We both have computer and electrical backgrounds. Um, so day in and day out, we're working with major software companies, electronics companies, uh, game companies, hence why we're here today, um, to help protect their, their, their patent and inventions, their copyrights, their trademarks, and, and all that sort of stuff. Um, so for the topic today, well, so yeah, going back, just <laughs> quick disclaimer, um, like most of the, the presentations today, um, you know, none of this is legal advice it's presented for uh, educational value. We are lawyers, we're not your lawyers, but you can talk to us if you need a lawyer. Um, so for what we'll go through today, um, we're, we're, we, we're seeing the, the explosion of virtual reality and augmented reality technologies, and it's, it's really changing how we interface with our games and the type of experiences that um, you know, we're able to engage in. And it's an amazing explosion of technology. We're solving problems that have never been encountered before. And that's where patents live by definition, is when you're working on new technology and you're solving technology problems in a new way, that's what patents are designed to protect. But there's actually quite a few issues that arise when you're trying to patent things in virtual reality and augmented reality. We bump into kind of all three of the big problems that you run into in patents. Um, a lot of times things in virtual reality, just by virtue of being virtual, um, you know, can be characterized as abstract ideas, which is the type of area that it's kind of the one thing you can't patent. Um, we also see, because virtual reality is something that people have dreamed about since forever, um, there's been a lot of ideas on what we're going to do in virtual reality, what you can do. It's just nobody was able to do it before. So we run into a really interesting prior art problem. And then the other thing that we're finding is virtual reality has sort of taken off as, as, a, as a gaming tool, as a, as a fun way to sort of work with this technology, but it turns out there's so many other non-game applications. So we're going to take each one of these issues in turn and sort of talk through um, you know, what we're seeing in the industry and what we think best practices are. Now, patents are not a topic that comes up every day for every company. So a big part of, of what we would hope people take away today is, is sort of issue spotting. You know, when do I have a patent issue? When do I need to be talking to a patent attorney about protecting an idea? And, and just what do I need to pay attention to? So. so to kind of begin here, we'll give you a very high level idea of what patents are, kind of what to look for. Again, we're issue spotting here. We're not going to go deep into the law too much for you, but We'll give you a high level overview of what's going on. So in protecting innovation, what we're really saying here in the slide is that we're protecting cool new ideas. Now, not all ideas are protectable, and we'll get into that a bit more detail soon, but the basic idea is the government has decided certain things they will protect for you that you can get a patent for. Now, you see here a great example of this, and one of my favorites is Nintendo's directional pad, right? They're pretty good, and there was a patent on them to the fact that no one else could do it, which is arguably why Sega's directional pad back in the day was not as good. They had the patent on exactly the way to do that. It was their cool new idea, it was better, it was more comfortable to hold, for example, and it made it great. Now again, they only, we are only protecting things that the government actually has said we're going to protect, and that's generally speaking inventions. What that means in so many words is it's something kind of new and cool. But that doesn't mean that it has to be machine. Like when you think of patent, I think like, oh, it's cool, it's like a... Like a light bulb or something. It doesn't have to be that. Uh, in general, however, it has to be something along those lines, inventive at least. And it only lasts for 20 years. Now, we'll get into that, but the big takeaway on that is it is a legal monopoly for those 20 years. What does that mean? It means you have a, the government has given you a stick with which you can go whack other people with. If it's your invention, you can protect it, and you can prevent other people from doing it. That's a big deal. It's really hard to do that with certain forms of other IP. You know, trademarks are one thing you can go against people, but it's got to be something you've proven you've put in some money or investment into, people recognize it. Patents, you don't even have had to do it as long as you invented it. And you can prevent other people from doing it in a very strong way. And of course, there's a lot of money in there too. Now, one unique aspect of patents that is distinguished from perhaps a copyright or certain in certain circumstances a trademark, they do get some form of examination is that you got to go to the government and say, hey, I want this thing, and you got to actually get them to give it to you. That requires what we call substantive examination. What that really means is that you've got to prove at least three things. First of all, it's got to be the thing that the government wanted to give you in the first place. It's got to be subject matter eligible. It's got to be the, of the category of things that the government basically says we will protect under patent law. 
The second thing is it's got to be new and non-obvious. Now, that's a very fancy way of saying, basically, that it's got to be something that's not been done before. And there's two dimensions of that. The first one is it's got to be something that you can't find a single document or a single instance of someone doing it before. So if it's the exact thing that's already been done, of course you can't get a patent on it. The second thing is a bit more complicated, non-obvious. It means kind of what it sounds like. It means that you can't, it could not have been obvious to someone, who, as we say, of ordinary skill in the art. That means an ordinary program, an ordinary game developer could not have gone, yeah, I could have figured that out. A great example of this, if the claims in the patent, which we'll get to, say, uh, do it with WordPerfect, and you can go, well, I can do it with uh, Microsoft Word, then it's obvious, right? Duh. The third one is written description. In so many words, what this actually means is you've got to format the thing like the government wants you to. you got to provide it in a very particular manner. It's got to be something that someone can pick up and actually know what the hell you invent. That sounds easy, but it can get quite complicated. And there are arguments to be made, we can kind of get into a little bit, that it's not nearly as clear and there will be a lot of fixes that can be made to, to this particular statute. But in the basic idea, you got to give them the document as they request it. Yeah, I mean, I think looking at these three requirements, you can kind of look at it as, is this the right type of thing? Is this a functional thing? Is this a piece of technology? And then, are you the first person to do it? Or did somebody do it before? Or they would have just thought to do it? And then, did you tell us enough about how to do it so that somebody else could do it? Those are really the three requirements here. So speaking of 112, patents end in claims. And claims are basically the thing that define the boundary to which you have, you say, your invention is. These are arguably the most important part of the patent. They are also the most horrible to read, they're the most boring, they're the most technical. And we, we've got a great example up here, so you know we'll, we'll make some audience participation here. So I've got um, a Yeti mug. Um, these are really awesome. If you haven't had one before, they will keep your eyes cold for 48 hours or something like that. So we're going to read out parts of this claim, and if anybody can guess what this is actually about, then this is yours. And if you looked ahead in your slides, you're cheating and don't participate. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so there are certain aspects of this. I'm going to have to read this carefully. It's got a main body. It's got first and second grips. It's got a plurality of first thrusting operators. It's got a plural plurality of second thrusting operators. And at the very back bottom there, it says a third and fourth operating units each having a rotation, rotation member. Does anyone have a clue what the hell this is talking about? Uh, back there? The cap for what? No. <laughs> oh no! Sorry. This is this is a game patent. This is so. a game patent. <laughs> the very first line: the operating device for a game machine. We skipped that part. Yeah. Uh, Sam. I'm gonna guess Xbox controller. You're close. Very close. <laughs> it is. Any guess what the thrusting operators are? All the joysticks are the rotational yeah, members. They rotate. The thrusting operators are shoulder buttons. But. Yeah, it's, it's R2, L2, basically, yeah. So as you might appreciate, claims are not the most clear thing in the world. They are designed to be a definition of what is your property. It's like those old school things you see about land property. It's like, well, it extends 50 yards this way. It's horrible to read, but this is the thing that defines what you invented, which is why we spend so much of our time doing what we do. Yeah, I think if there's anything that you take away today, it's don't judge a patent by its cover. Don't look at the figure on the front and say, wow, they just patented green screens or that sort of thing. You have to look at the claims at the end to say, okay, what did they actually claim as their legal right? What does this patent cover? And it can be a big project to unpack it, to read through, figure out what all these ridiculous words mean. What is, why is thrusting member the shoulder buttons? I don't know. You have to read the patent and find out. Um, so... Yeah, just, just try to keep in mind that the claims of the patent really define the legal right there. And so before you get up in arms about somebody patenting a period or a green screens or whatever, um, take a look at what they actually cover. And that's actually kind of important. If, if some of you have seen that show Shark Tank, they're always saying, oh, I got a patent on this. They're not talking about the claims. They know what the hell the claims are. Those could be five pages long, voluminous crap like this in which no one can infringe that by definition. So the most common type of patent is a utility patent. What that really means is it's something you can do something with. I'm simplifying here, but that's the idea. In the video game context, this has a few dimensions. The first one is you're gonna have these tech, this technology and hardware. That's your consoles, that's your like hard stuff that you can pick up. There's also user interfaces like the controllers you hold. Uh, in some respects, we'll get into this, but a lot of this is gonna be your sort of, if I can touch it sort of stuff. It's a processor, it's a graphics processor, things like that. 
There's also, of course, programs, right? Don't discount that. You'll see here under technology, it says AI and communications. Under support programs, we have things like level editors and motion capture. These are all very much patentable under certain circumstances. Again, we'll get into it, but you have to understand, it doesn't necessarily have to be something you touch, although, of course, as we discussed with the DualShock 2, it still oftentimes is. So remember, if you're playing around with a program, if you're developing something on a computer, you are not patent ineligible. You might still be, especially if you create something new and not, again, novel, non-obvious, and if it, you can, we can write it up in a way that's protectable. Yeah, and usually when you hear somebody talk about patents, they mean utility patents. So does anyone recognize what that little icon on the right-hand side is? I recognize this is or the, the drawing, figure 14 on the right-hand side. Yeah. Bingo. It's the arrow above it that's the invention. It's the you idea of... any more prizes. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, basically it's the arrow on top. That was the inventive part. Then there's more to it, the claims, all the good stuff. But the arrow at the top is what it was. And we'll get it. Let's remember this because we'll talk about something, a very unique issue to this very soon on. But remember, it's not the car. It's not the, the layout. It's not the fact that you're driving a taxi. It's that arrow. But there's more in terms of IP. We're going to give you a very quick overview of the rest of it, mostly in contrast to patents just so we have a basis for discussion. Just to remind you that even though we're talking about patents, there are other areas you can protect yourself. You know, don't think that we're just going to be talking about patents to, to bore you, basically. Yeah, we don't want to step on Adam's toes. <laughs> I think that was a great discussion of trademarks and copyrights. Um, but with, with intellectual property, it's always key to kind of keep in mind you know, what protects what and how they all work together. Right. The next thing here is design patents. These are ones that you might see as a sentence in a horn book somewhere, but no one really talks about. We do our firm does a hell of a lot of them, which is kind of fun. Design patents are ornamental, non-functional designs. Now, what the hell does that mean? It means it's actually the exact opposite of utility patent. Utility, it's got utility. Ornamental designs, not so much. This, to some of you have heard the speech before, that sounds a lot like a trade dress, right? Like this looks like a thing that you know, it's design. The basic idea is, the unique thing here as contrasted with that is you don't actually have to show what we say here, secondary meaning. You can just come up with a really cool design and then you can just basically go after a patent on it. Uh, we represent a lot of shoemakers on those at that front and make sure that no one can have it before they release it. So design patents are a really interesting area that we think is going to become a lot more important in, in video games. Um, the, the law on design patents has, design patents got a lot more uh, attention because if you remember the big Apple versus Samsung battle. That was really driven by design patents. The design of the, some people thought it was ridiculous, the you know, rectangular phone with rounded edges and that sort of thing. Um, but that, that ended up changing the law on, on damages for designs and, and so it's renewed a lot of interest in them. Design patents are relevant to games because we were talking earlier about how copyrights are going to protect the expression in your game, your characters, your models and that sort of thing. Design patents will also protect the models in your games, and those can be really useful protections against you know, straight up reskins and that sort of knockoff, where, hey, you know, my tank is in a different color camo than yours, so I didn't actually copy it. If you have a design patent on kind of the form and shape of that tank in sort of a non-functional way, um, you, you know, that's, that's another arrow in your quiver. Uh, if you remember your property law, we always talk about quivers and arrows, so. <laughs> So again, unique designs. This is kind of an interesting one. Has anyone heard of the Game Vice case? It's basically a company that came out of the woodwork and sued Nintendo for the Switch. They had utility and design patents. Utility patents and design patents over basically having two controllers on the side of a screen quite like this. Now they ended up selling this case out. I looked it up uh, yesterday, so we don't know what exactly happened, but it, more likely than not, they walked away with a substantial sum. Yeah, and this one's kind of an interesting one, because if you look at the Game Vice, device that they had, and unfortunately the colors aren't coming up just right, but um, they had this idea of it was a case for your, your phone or mobile device, and it, it, it had controllers on both sides, and, and you can insert your phone into it, so you can hear a lot of functional stuff there. Um, you know, if you look at the switch, the fact that the controllers can pop on and off, that sounds really functional. Um, but there were also sort of design protections on this arrangement of having kind of the controllers on either side of the screen and that sort of thing. And certainly if you've been around the block for long enough, you know there's lots of um, portable devices out there that kind of had that idea. So, you know, the design patent here was a bit more limited in exactly how it's shaped out. So, with the settlement, you know, you never know what happened, but I, I think if you look at this one, there actually were quite a few differences. Right. So next one, really quickly, we've already heard a little bit of copyright, just to remind you, it's creative works. It's a little bit different in the sense that it's a lot longer than patent, so if you, you know, it's actually kind of nice in that way. At the same time, there are some difficulties asserting it. Patents, 
from at least our perspective, our very sort of uh, selfish perspective on this topic as patent lawyers, it's a, it's a bit easier to prove or at least a bit easier to argue because the statute's so strong. Again, it's a legal monopoly. You can come in there and hit hard. Uh, with copyright, there's a lot more nuance, and it can be a harder case. I think it's best to think of patents as casting a broader shadow, a broader net. Um, with patents, somebody has to kind of copy your big picture idea, the, the way that you're doing something, but not necessarily do it in exactly the same way that you did it in your product, just the, the way that you described as your invention in your patent, whereas in copyrights, the, the copying needs to be a lot closer. So, of course, the example, the easy example is copying a game directly. Here's an old case from 1982 talking about copying Mario Brothers pretty damn directly. Uh, it looks very much the same. The one on the right's a knockoff. So trademarks, you've heard a little bit about Protect Brands. This is probably the one you're most familiar with just because it's the one you see every day. I mean, we've probably got a bazillion different trademarks sitting around here, you know, Coke can logos and things like that. Basic idea is distinguishing your company. It's a way to know what's real or not. Um, a lot of companies, including, you know, big brands like Nintendo, have to aggressively enforce these. <laughs> a, great, a great example, which I'm sure will be discussed later as well, is this idea Ion Maiden, Iron Maiden. That's fundamentally a sort of trademark case. Finally, trade dress really quickly. Trade dress is sort of like things like distinctive colors. Now, when we think of video game companies in the most general sense, you think like what, blue, Sony, green, Xbox, red, Nintendo-ish, that's arguably trade dress. Now, would they be able to pursue that? I don't know, maybe, probably not, honestly. Uh, but that's kind of the thing that trade dress protects is like I just associate this company with this color or this type of design. You know, I look for the boxes that are like this, that's that. Now, some of you might be going, that sounds a hell of a lot like the, the design patents you talked about. A little bit of a difference, you've got to associate. Yes, it does. It does. <laughs> uh, associate, or secondary meaning is the big difference. These guys have associated secondary meaning. You go to E3, you see the color, you know, that's a Sony booth. Uh, whereas with the, you know, design patents, you don't have to do that. You just file for it, fight about it, and eventually you got it. Very, very finally, trade secrets are a little bit in the gaming industry now. The biggest example would be... Uh, any sort of punk buster, vac ban type stuff, they're keeping that a secret because they don't want you to know how they're going to ban you if you cheat. And that's kind of where this comes in. There is an argument to be made that there are other aspects of video games that play into this, but we won't talk about it too much. Just nice to know that, yeah, you can keep a trade secret in the video game world. Now let's make a big transition here and talk a little bit about why it's so damn hard to patent video games sometimes. Because it can be. You know, we've, we've had a number of different applications recently that have been genuinely hard to get. And it's, we'll, as we'll describe, it's getting easier, it's getting quite nice in a way, but there are a lot of difficulties we still face. And the biggest topic we're going to talk about here is that very first bullet point we talked about, the substantive examination, the 101 examination, whether or not it's something the government says, I want to give you as a patent. Yeah, now, as a quick sidebar, uh, sort of before 2014, this was barely a requirement of patents. You could pretty much patent anything. But in 2014, the Supreme Court came out with a decision called Alice that said, you can't patent abstract ideas. Well, everybody knew that. That's been the law for a long time. But then they sort of upended what an abstract idea is. So if you've been to any patent or IPCLE that sort of touched on patents in the last five years, they were talking about this. Um, the good news is, for the last five years, we would just stand up here and talk about what a nightmare it is and how confusing it is. But in 2019, I'm starting to feel a lot better about it. I think now we've got some clarity, and I think that we actually know what the tests are. We've got enough examples. And so, you know, today we're comfortable standing up here and saying that we can actually give you some useful guidance on what might be patentable and what it's not. So to begin here, let's start with the most boring slide that we have in this deck, which is the 101 section. It's basically saying what the law is, which is it has to be a new and useful machine, manufacturer, composition of matter, or any new and useful improvement thereof. Many of you are probably going, well, video games ain't machines for the most part. Why are we able to get patents? The basic idea is that it's a very broad category um, in general, but this is the law that says what is patentable. A computer that's running code <laughs> is a special machine. There so, you go. Yeah. In translation, let's flip that. It means, again, abstract ideas cannot be patented. The, the, the phrase basically is abstract ideas, laws of nature, and natural phenomenon. You can't patent a bee, for example. Abstract ideas include, in the video game context, first one's fundamental economic principles. You can't patent pay to win. There are aspects of pay to win you can go after, but in generally speaking, you can't say the, uh, a method comprising taking money and giving them coins so they can pay me for stuff. Second one, methods of organizing human activity. Guilds are a great example. You can't go a method of comprising, putting everybody together and making them play the game together. That's not going to work. 
Third one, mathematical relationships and formulae. Now that's a little bit different for some, a lot of ways. It gets a bit more complicated than that as we'll get into, but the basic idea is you can't patent like uh, a, a method comprising one coin equal one point. Probably ain't gonna work. Finally, an idea of itself. This is a weird category because it kind of is open-ended, but the way to think about it is the concept of winning, you can't patent. The method comprising, yeah, you win. Okay, whatever. What it comes back to is that patents are supposed to be about technology. They're supposed to be about solutions to technical problems. So if what you're claiming is just these ideas without actually what you're solving, what sort of application you're engaged in, um, you know, you're in trouble. You'll hear some examiners from the USPTO say things like, well, if you can put it in your head, it's not an invention. That's kind of an incorrect statement, but that's kind of how they think of it. So this is my happy little slide that explains exactly kind of how I view things. This is not by any means statutorily based. This is how I view this. There's a spectrum, right? On the left hand, farthest left hand side here, you see the hardcore electrical engineering, like that's straight up patentable type stuff. Uh, a good example would be a processor. A good example would be like a, a machine. Like if it's, again, the DualShock 2, I mean, it's a thing you hold. It's an invention in the way in which you hold it. That's pretty clearly in that category, 101. Then we move a little bit over to what I call pure computer science, even that's kind of a bad term for that. It's the stuff that you would probably see in like a computer science textbook. We're seeing things like, this is how we're going to improve the networking functionality. We're going to improve the way we store that data. We're going to, you know, make that graphics processor work better. It's that kind of stuff. You know, if it's something that John Carmack rants about, it's probably in that category. Next over, if we go a little bit we're on the right-hand side, we see what we'll call applied computer science. This is kind of where video games lie. This is where we see the danger begin because we're getting more and more close to what you're doing with that call those concepts. We hear computer-driven gameplay, you know, gameplay type concepts. Uh, user behavior modifications, example, like, hey, we're gonna modify the video game so they have more fun or they get frustrated less, which is something we've worked on a number of times. <laughs> that kind of stuff, as you can see, it's getting in the danger zone. We're getting into a territory where the USPTO is gonna go, I don't feel comfortable about this. They may not be right under US law currently, but they're gonna feel very uncomfortable about this. And we've, that's where a lot of our fights are existing right now is that little, that line right there. And I, I mean, I think a big part of that line is asking what's actually the invention here? You know, are you just using a classic game that you didn't really change that much about, but what's cool is you, you know, change the, the scoring system or something like that. Um, that's where you start to run into a lot more troubles. If instead you had to <laughs> revamp your code in this really big way because it's, there's no easy way to, to sort of combine coins and points. I don't know how that would work, but um, yeah, the, the, that's an area where you'd be on the, the good side of the line. Right. And finally, we already talked a little bit about trademark, copyright, stuff like that. Perhaps, obviously, you're, you're not gonna be able to do that. You can't go to try to patent your, your cool drawing. There's other IP for that, don't do it. So let's go through some examples to see if we all kind of understand it, because these are kind of fun. They will illustrate how easy things have gotten and also how kind of BS things can be. First one, who thinks that the Sony cell processor as used in the PlayStation 3 is patentable? What does he do? Hands, who cares? This was his example, so every hand should be up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, yes, there's a patent on that. Note also that there are copyrights on what's called the mask works, as I said, the lithographic mask works that you use to print this thing. Yeah, there's a bunch of innovations. Apparently it sucks to program for it, but it is an innovation nonetheless, so it exists, it is patentable, there are a bunch of patents on it. How wonderful. Next one, Farmville animal breeding. Who thinks this is patentable? Yep. <laughs> I agree with everyone in the room. <laughs> we, yeah, we agree with you. <laughs> this is some crap. <laughs> but yes, this is an issued patent on this. It describes how you can have one animal, another animal, they have like, like uh, what is it, uh, aspects to them. If you put them together, it merges into a third animal, which has uh, like the combination of the two. Your red cow and your white cow give you a pink cow. Basically. It's, uh, it's really confusing, it makes no sense. We don't quite understand it ourselves, but nonetheless, this is great for us because it means a lot of stuff is patentable. <laughs> Third, Tetsuya Nomura's belt-focused fashion, his obsession with putting Final Fantasy characters into belts. Anybody think this is patentable? No. <laughs> Copyright, basically. If that. I mean, the games are patentable, or the copyrightable, the, the characters are arguably protected by copyright. There are elements of these things that are, generally speaking, however, those aspects of it, not really. Finally, PSN achievement. Yeah, sorry, this question. Oh. I have a question about this number two. Sure. Yeah. If it's patentable, if Zynga patents this, have they used it against other developers, you know, forbidding them from using the same mechanism? Not to my knowledge. Yeah. If they haven't done that, then why they patent it? 
Right. So I, I mean, there, there's a lot of reasons to get patents besides suing uh, suing other companies. Um, you know, they're 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 good as a shield. Uh, they can help you defend if somebody else were to come sue you. You know, you have weapons of your own. They also are a nice mark to show. You know, we're a technology company. We're an innovative company. So they, they might have this patent for that purpose. Um, patents are a great way to sort of incentivize your employees, you know, to recognize them um, as, you know, we value your contributions, so we, we wanted to get, you know, the U.S. government stamp of approval on it. Um, I also think whenever you have a patent, um, you know, you've got to balance, you know, what is somebody else doing? What is the likelihood that they're doing exactly what our claims cover versus the likelihood that this patent might survive extra scrutiny? So when you're at the patent office, uh, a U.S. patent examiner is going to spend maybe 30 hours looking through <laughs> your patent. So in that time, they have to check all three boxes. You know, is this the type of thing that we allow you to patent? Did anybody do this before? And did you describe it well enough? So you know, th they don't. They do a really good job at the patent office, but they don't do a perfect job, and they don't try to do a perfect job. What happens is when you get a patent lawsuit, now you have two armies of lawyers that each spend hundreds of hours trying to tear it apart. Um, and so, you know, I'm, I'm not weighing in on this particular patent, but with patents that, you know, you might ask, why do they even bother patenting that? A lot of times, maybe it's not going to get asserted because they think, hey, maybe this one won't survive in litigation. But, you know, I don't, I don't know anything about this particular <laughs> patent. I know the idea sounds a little bit to me of, just combining two attributes and getting a new character, um, I we'll, we'd have to test that one against <laughs> current law. Mason. Yeah. So regarding the patents for edge, you're going to do this later on. But, uh, mm -hmm. but patents versus trade secrets. Yep. Uh, I figure a lot of patents like this one may relate to algorithms that are stored in cloud-based systems. Uh, they're not downloaded, so people don't necessarily have access to them. And of course, algorithms can be incredibly valuable as trade. Uh, so if you have a client that, let's say it is inventive, it does qualify for patents, are you, how are you advising them what the heck are you going to go for trade secret and keep secret at this point to make it public? Sure. So I, I mean, one of the biggest issues with trade secrets is that they're only a trade secret so long as nobody else can figure it out. So I, I mean, it, it is a big part of can somebody sort of reverse engineer this part or at least get the good bits out, right? Um, so you would go after patent protection if you thought, okay, you know, our approach to this is sufficiently inventive that we could actually get some patent protection and that by filing this public disclosure, because your patent does get published and so everybody's going to get an instruction manual on how to do it, well, that's not going to give them the secret sauce that they need to go out and do their own version of it but tweak something so they don't infringe our patent. So if you're, not, if you're not worried about giving somebody the seed to kind of make their own version but change something, then patents are a great approach, particularly in computer software. One of the reasons why Coke is always the example of trade secrets is because you know, they've been in business for 100, 200 years or something. Um, computer software, video games have barely been around for 40 years at this point. Um, 20 years is a ages, it's eons in, in the software industry. So we see um, patents frequently being um, you know, preferred choice if, we, if you think that what you're doing is sufficiently novel. Trade secrets are a great option where what you're doing, you know, maybe you've tweaked a bunch of parameters and you've gotten them just right. A lot of times tuning, tweaking is not patentable because that's just normal experimentation, you know, taking this method and, and tweaking, oh, we're gonna use a 0.6% chance that the parent cow's gene gets passed on and somehow that's what our players really like. You know, that's something that's probably not patentable, but if you kept that as your trade secret sauce, you know, that, that would give you an edge. So. There's one more left. PSN achievement notifications. Who thinks these are patentable? One, two, three, four, five. Yes, absolutely. Um, in this case, it's Again, it seems kind of strange because, again, we, we led this off by talking about machines. reason for this, again, is the computer as a machine, especially like a computing machine. Also, there's a value to this, right? I mean, that's kind of not just sort of a play value aspect to it, but sort of <clears throat> notifications like this, UI elements, these are patentable in many respects. And, you know, I think with a lot of these examples, we're kind of guilty of what we told you at the beginning <laughs> not to do. 
Um, in, <laughs> in every one of these, um, you know, they, they end with a set of claims that explains exactly what it is that they consider, what they invented, and, and what is technological about it, and what the contribution is. So um, while some of these, you know, just the idea of a notification, that's, that's not going to be patentable. It's, it's how they're doing it. Um, it's the particular way that they're generating it, maybe where they're putting it, maybe what they're including it in, where they're pulling that data from, you know, that sort of thing. It, it's going to go beyond the idea of a pop-up notification. So in general, you might get this vibe from all this discussion we've had that it's getting real easy, right? And that would make sense. You just said that, in fact. And what's happened is, excuse me, in January of 2019, I believe it was, we had what we call the revised subject matter eligibility guidelines come up from the USPTO. And what the USPTO basically did was say, hey, we recognize that we've been kind of kind of strict on this and it's not been so great for us. And it basically provided guidelines for examiners at the USPTO to know, all right, when I pick up this guy's patent application, here's what I need to know. In practice, in our, in our view, it's made things significantly easier. In fact, it's damn near back to 2014 levels where you can kind of file whatever. We're still seeing rejections on this point. We're still seeing the government go, no, 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 you can't get that. But that almost always happens anyway. So in general, it's getting way easier than it used to be. It's nice. It's kind of nice. I mean, we're, we're no longer having to explain why gameplay value is something of value to people. I mean, a lot of video game inventions at some level are talking about how cool it is and it makes it more fun. And that used to be kind of not a good argument because they'd go, well, I don't care. That's not inventive. <laughs> now we're seeing some, some bite on that. They're seeing, okay... Gamification, for example, is kind of nice. So we're going to give you four examples of things to keep in mind when you're thinking, hey, is this something in the category that the government will give me a patent on? These are actual arguments we make a lot to get you back allowed. These are things that are explicitly listed as stuff that is allowable. And this is not a comprehensive list. We're not giving you everything you need to know. These are the big four that affect video games the most. And the first one's going to be integrating an abstract idea into a practical application. In other words, you're taking this generic concept, which if we abstract it out to its extremes, is something you can cram in your head that's irrelevant, and we're putting it into a cool way of doing something that is itself inventive. A great example of this that we've seen plenty of times, we'll talk about it a little bit in the future, is preventing nausea in VR. The concept, the unbolted part there, preventing nausea, it's not that, it's an idea, right? You how to not get sick in the car. But in VR, it's kind of an inventive thing, right? You've got to do things. You've got to worry about refresh rate. You've got to worry about how you're presenting things, how you're moving in the VR space. That's all very much allowable, and it's all very much patentable. The next one is not designed to monopolize the abstract idea. This is kind of a gamesmanship argument, saying, look, I know this kind of relates to abstract ideas, but I'm not trying to take over that space. I'm not going to sue everybody who's doing that. I have a very particularized idea in mind that I'm going after. In this case, you know, making kids pay for stuff has been around forever. Toys have been around forever. But boy, Skylanders figured out a way to make them put it on little, sta like little stands and sell a hell of a lot of them to kids, and then they failed. But, <laughs> but the basic idea is, you know, gamify toys. That's kind of cool. And the way in which they did it was particularly novel. Now, granted, a lot of the Skylanders patents I've seen are very much about that base, about, about the toys, and that sort of thing. But the general concept of making kids pay for more toys, action figures, that's been around for a while. If room is to the functioning of a computer, this is your old school, good old patentable, like look how good of a CS guy I am. A uh, great example here is collision detection. This is stuff that's in video game space, right? Like it's kind of unique to video games and saying make sure Mario don't clip through the wall. But as applied to video games, it's a very technological thing. It's like, all right, our processing is better. And some of you might be wondering, I just mentioned, you know, mathematical fo formula not being that. Sure, mathematical formulas are involved here. And if you filed something like collision detection using math, yeah, they're going to come back and say, that looks a lot like math to me. But still, the concept here, including, you know, stuff on computers is, is, is mathematically based anyway, so the concept here of improving collision, collision detection is pretty great. Yeah, the, going back to that one, I mean, this is kind of the silver bullet um, when it comes to abstract ideas, is, is being able to argue that, look, well, the problem that we're solving, yes, maybe people have to know how to walk around and climb stuff, okay? But my pen, it's not about just the idea of climbing stuff in a virtual world. It's about solving those problems that are unique to virtual worlds. As a human, you just know, okay, this is an edge that I can hang from or something like that. But how does a computer know that? The computer needs to do a lot of calculations. It needs to send out you know, 3D ray traces and sort of detect some collisions and figure out the properties of the ledge and then decide, okay, if your character jumps near here, it can grab onto this. So that's an area where you can say, look, I'm solving a problem that is very hard for computers. Whether or not it's easy for people, that shouldn't matter because my claims, my invention is about 
how to enable computers to do it, to do something that they couldn't do before. And finally, significantly more of the abstract idea. This is a bit of a weird one. Again, these are all arguments that seem very fluffy when I describe them like this. The basic idea is advertising's been around forever. But there are certain ways to do advertising that we've never done before and that are significantly more. A great example, there are issued patents about how to advertise to people based upon what they're doing in a video game. That seems skeevy as hell, I recognize. But nonetheless, the idea is like, hey, you're loading. We know that in loading circumstances, we can display a advertisement to you. However, if you're playing the game in an intense moment, why the hell will we bother? You're not going to pay attention. So we, we've talked about the, the abstract idea picture, and, and you know, we've painted a little bit of a rosier picture of saying, OK, fine, that long nightmare is finally over, maybe, um, on whether or not you can patent these, these game techniques. But with virtual reality, we're seeing another issue, which is, I mean, well, by show of hands, who here is really excited about virtual reality and everything that's happening there? I am. Well, you know, who here, you know, thought about virtual reality 20 years ago? And, and you know, <laughs> imagine, wouldn't it be great, you know, uh, watching Star Trek and, hey, I'm in the, the hollow room and that sort of thing. And, and that's, that's really the issue that we're seeing is with patents, it is about, you know, has anybody done this before? Or, and, and when you are talking at a high level about ideas and concepts, well, the fact is science fiction writers and, and people have imagined and dreamed and envisioned what VR might look like for, for quite a long time. So, you know, I guess this could be the second most boring slide in our deck, <laughs> but, you know, the statute here on saying you can't patent something that somebody else did before or somebody gave out before. What this really is about is we're only going to give you that 20 years of protection, that, that you know, monopoly on nobody else can do this if you tell us how to do it so that at the end of your time, everybody can do it. So the law says if somebody already told us how to do it, then why would we let you be the only person to do it? We already know how to do it. We don't need to pay you this exclusive monopoly to get <laughs> it out of you. Um, and then sort of extending on that, well, if, if everything that's out there you know, it'd be pretty clear to put it all together in that way, um, then we're also not going to let you have a patent. So, like I said, I mean, virtual reality is something people have thought about for a long time. And um, you can see here, we have an example from 1838 of stereoscopic viewers that sort of allowed you to get that, um, you know, Oculus headset with the, the one picture on the left side and one picture on the right side. So, 1838, I think that would probably classifies prior art. Um, but, you know, we, we've seen a lot of stuff since then. So, um, you know, in, in 1928, we saw some examples of flight simulators that, you know, tried to set you into what does it feel like to be in this cockpit? What does it feel like to be flying through the air? You know, what are you going to see even though you're sitting in a training warehouse or that sort of thing? So, you know, virtual reality is awesome. Um, you know, you get to feel like you're really there, but there's still a lot to come, right? I mean, I was promised, like, smell of vision and weather effects and that sort of thing. Um, not new. They did it in 1957. So sensorama, smell of vision, um, you know, already existed. So it, it's, it's just things like this that are sort of examples. I mean, Virtual Boy, I grew up with this, played it a lot in the car, which was like a double dose of motion sickness. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure it's the reason I have to wear contacts and glasses now. Um, <laughs> But yeah, so, so virtual reality is just full of history. People, it's not just been dreamers, it's also been people trying to make it. Um, you know, in, in looking, in preparing this presentation, we found a lot of these great examples. So here you have a motorcycle game where you're wearing a headset and, uh, you know, it's not really high fidelity, which I think is one of the reasons why people are so excited about VR now, so that we've finally sort of crossed that believability threshold. Um, but all of this stuff that happened before is arguably prior art, which, sort of informs going forward that the focus really needs to be on what's changed, how are we doing it, and why does that make it, why does that mean now I own a headset, whereas before, you know, I didn't need to. Um, so, you know, in this space, certainly the hardware, that's the easy part to patent. I mean, nobody's going to question that. Um, the hardware has made such big leaps and bounds that it's, it's fundamentally different from anything that we've seen before. Um, the screens, the straps, I mean, when you're strapping a five-pound thing to your head, you kind of have a pretty good strap there. 
the, the motion tracking, that's huge. Um, the, the cameras that are going on, eye tracking, um, the way that we, your, your foot controllers, your hand controllers, that sort of stuff. Um, but then also the, the UI. So we have seen for 40 plus years, you know, computers have had uh, GUIs and user interfaces. Um, but in virtual reality, everything's different. You know, you're interacting with stuff in a very different manner. You're looking in different ways. You can look all around you instead of just at a screen. Um, so we see a lot of uh, UX um, improvements that get, that get patented in this space, as Kirk mentioned. Solving that problem of making you want to throw up every time you put the headset on has been a big area. Um, but then also on the gameplay front, things that you do in VR that you would never do anywhere else. The idea that you pinch your fingers together to pick something up, that didn't happen on a you know, game pad. Um, and we're, we're seeing a big uptick in this, but I think it's also important to note that VR never went away. VR has always been there. People have been patenting it. Um, you know, this is a chart of how many patent applications come in talking about virtual reality and augmented reality. And, and certainly it's way higher now than it was just eight years ago. But I think it's important to know that people have been active in the space for a long time. Um, and you can see here sort of all the usual players that you would expect um, are sort of patenting in this space. We were a little bit surprised that you know Facebook Oculus um, wasn't on here or, or HTC. Um, and, and I think that speaks a little bit to just you know, how, how often they throw virtual reality in, but certainly um, you know, big companies are paying attention to this area and they're, they're exploring intellectual property here. Um, and, and we're <laughs> pleased to report that the US is really a leader when it comes to patent activity in the virtual reality and augmented reality space. Um, so we're just seeing uh, you know, much more activity here than anywhere else, though I have a feeling that China number is really on the rise because we have seen just worldwide in patents that the Chinese intellectual property system has really grown up and matured and sort of gone to the point where it's, it's actually quite usable. So basically the idea is nothing new. <laughs> you're going to have trouble. It's going to be tough and it, it's fine. You should be okay with it. In fact, if you're sitting in here as a developer or someone's considering who's innovating that space, <coughs> this should actually kind of calm you down a little bit because what you have to understand is unless it's an act, if it's not an active, like issued patent that is enforceable right now, you're fine. As in, if someone came up with it in the 80s, have fun. <laughs> no one's going to be able to sue you on it. You should feel some comfort in that. Now, granted, there are a lot of patents out there on this that are very much enforceable. And you should, of course, talk to counsel about that. But the general concept is, the vague idea of virtual realities out there, it is both a shield for you as well as a sword. If, it's a great sword if you're able to get a patent on it, and it's a great shield because it's been done so much before that the likelihood of somebody, someone able to sue you on that, kind of low. Yeah, I mean, we put our disclaimer up there earlier, so this is not legal advice, but I've seen so many people who just get nervous. They start reading patents, and of course <laughs> it sounds like you're doing this, and then you become paralyzed, and you decide to stop creating, and stop making, and stop doing what you're doing. And, and that's just not, not the right approach here. Um, you know, there, there are lots of patent applications out there. They're very nuanced. That's the reason why Kirk and I specialize in this area is because they're confusing as hell. <laughs> and just the act of figuring out what a patent covers, whether or not it's valid, whether or not it's scary, um, you know, is a big legal undertaking. So I, I would, you know, I, I would say don't get into that phase where you just start reading patents and then you become everything. I can't do anything. I'm so locked down by claims. I, I try not to get to that. Space. There is an active patent on how to play with a capital laser pointer, so you're all infringing patents probably at some point in your lives. <laughs> so just be okay with it. So let's put our tinfoil hats on now and talk a little bit something a bit weirder. The idea that virtual reality is also good for other stuff. You know, I'll explain why I just said that in a second. It is a surprise to no one that there are a lot of people in the business world who like virtual reality for stuff other than video games, which are the preferred use of video virtual reality, obviously. My preferred use. There you go. <laughs> I mean, Ford's using it to develop cars. Brain surgeons are using it to do surgery. It's all very cool and important, and I still like super hot much more. But the basic idea is this. Claiming video games explicitly in... So remember, we talked about those claims, right? We talked, we end at the very end, we say, this is our invention. The temptation for a lot of video game developers to say, well, I invented a video game thing. Let's talk about that. Bad idea. Reason being is because a lot of your inventions are much broader than that than you think. It's actually kind of nice. Your idea that applies to your particular video game embodiment, in fact, has a lot more dimensions for all these people making cars and doing brain surgery. 
And the basic idea is, first of all, it's hard to define what a video game is. I'm not trying to get all you know the verge on you and talk about whether or not Gone Home is a video game. I'm trying to say, look, is a video game like that little screen on your recumbent bicycle that shows you like where you're pedaling? I don't know. It's kind of hard to define. So if you say a method of playing a video game comprising, who the hell knows what that means? The second thing is, it's going to prevent you from suing non-video game companies, perhaps obviously. If, you, if your claim says explicitly for use in a video game, you got kind of got a problem on your hands. Because next thing you know, if the brain surgeons are infringing it, it's not really a video game, probably. They would argue that at least. I hope my brain surgeon doesn't think of it as a game. <laughs> oh no, I lost. Yeah. <laughs> All right, I'm going to start. <laughs> and the final thing is, honestly, it's not a good argument. We don't see success in this type of thing. You can't go, um, my invention's only for use outside, and suddenly getting it loud. It doesn't work like that. It never has. Yeah, I mean, I think that the point here is kind of thinking outside the game is patents protect inventions. They don't protect expression. So if you came up with a really great you know, way to interact with stuff in VR, um, or way to display information in VR. And yeah, you're doing it in your game. You know, thinking outside of the game, what other sort of applications would this have? Um, you know, it helps you cast a broader net. It also helps you understand the invention a lot better. Um, so th this is something to always keep in mind. Um, and to Kirk's kind of last point about how maybe this isn't even a, a helpful argument in the first place to say, oh yeah, well, I'm, this is, invention isn't a game. There actually are times where that can be the invention. Right? The idea is this was just something people did all day, but we turned it into a game. Now the video game part of it you know, kind of is the invention. So that's an area where it could be appropriate. Right. So in general, the basic, there's one interesting dimension to this, and it's a little bit of a sidebar, but just bear with us for a second. This is where the tinfoil hats come on. There's this interesting concept of, well, we're talking about whether or not something's real or virtual, and whether or not you want to talk about virtual video games or whatever. There's an interesting argument to be made that there are certain patents that could apply in the virtual world. Now remember, we mentioned design patents, the idea you got something that you've designed. Remember, it's, it's ornamental, it's non-functional. And there was this interesting case where basically uh, Call of Duty Black Ops 2 had this, this item called the Galva Knuckles, it's stun knuckles, boom. And there was an existing design patent on stun knuckles in real life. Well, does, does the design patent in real life for the thing that you can make and hold and stun people with in the street apply it to Black Call of Duty Black Ops 2. Ended up not kind of going that way, honestly. Yeah, I mean, this was, a, this was such an interesting case and it was just so disappointing in the <laughs> end. Because th this is the case where the facts were, oh man, you know, I've wanted to talk about this forever, and then they just look so different. So the facts here were kind of, no, of course this is not an infringement. They don't look anything alike. This is a design patent, so it only covers things that look like that. Um, the only thing that's similar between these two <laughs> is that it's the functionality of something you punch somebody with and it electrifies them. So, you know, this is kind of a loser from the beginning, <laughs> but it was just really exciting as an intellectual property lawyer that you could sue somebody <laughs> for virtually representing your, like, physical product. So while, you know, this, this wasn't groundbreaking law by any means, it was just, it was a really fun case to watch from a hypothetical standpoint. Um, and it, and it asks a lot of uh, interesting questions. You know, as we move into an increasingly virtual world, if you very accurate, accurately simulate, you know, how my really clever hammer works or how Legos work or whatever, um, you know, are you infringing a real world patent on how they stick together? I mean, I think there's a lot of arguments against it, right? The physical principles that are at play um, in a lot of these patents, you know, even if they are simulated in a virtual world, they're not the same. But th this is an area that I think that we'll, we'll see you know, a big battle in the future. Right. And here comes the marketing portion of this. You want to have a good patent lawyer to make sure you do this, right? I mean, this is all really complicated stuff. We're not expecting you to go out there and write this up yourself. In general, you want to know that your, your dude, your, your patent lawyer, is going to go off and do that right. In general, the idea here is very simple. You want to make sure you are a goof or gallant, not a goofus. You want to go make fat stacks and drive a Lambo because you wrote everything correctly. So there's some big takeaways here. As we discussed already, the basic idea is this. You want to make sure that you understand the concept of abstract ideas. It's gotten real chill. It's gotten much easier. But still, it's a problem. And you want to make sure that you kind of understand what is probably patentable, what not. You can go find a patent lawyer. They'll make the arguments for you. That's fine. You don't have to make those arguments yourself. But in general, you want to know the idea. In general, however, it's easier. So that's good news. These magic words are things to keep in mind. You know, this is not something you should go around with like a checklist, making sure they all fit. It doesn't work like that. Just keep these in mind. Know that, look, 
in general, this is the kind of stuff I should be looking for. When I'm you know, programming my game, what kind of problems am I solving? What have I done unique? These are all things that kind of lead to patentable concepts. And then finally, the VR can be really tough to patent. There's a lot of it out there. Candidly, it's, there's a lot of subtlety. It's kind of hard to kind of argue what's virtual and what's not. In generally the case, if you can screw up your claims real bad, but at the end of the day, it's you want to evaluate the landscape carefully. You want to really think, what have I invented? Be kind of focused on it. You know, candidly, most of you are probably not going to invent a headset that's been done. But if you come up with a new cool way to do something with that headset, that's where we're talking. Yeah, and piggybacking on uh, what Kirk was mentioning earlier, I, I mean, yes, we got a little bit in the weeds on what's an abstract idea, you know, what should your claims recite. But, but patents are really a specialty area. You can't work in patents unless you have a technical background too. So uh, like I opened with, I mean, I, I have a computer science background, Kirk's in electrical engineering. Um, it, it, is a, it, it is a specialty. It's not something that you, uh, you, you know, your, your general practice, corporate lawyer, contract lawyer does, but they usually know a guy. There's lots of great other patent lawyers in the room, Sam and Mark in the, the middle. Um, but this is an area where you need to know enough to know when you have a patent problem. Because as, as, as attorneys, as representatives for our clients, you know, our job is to issue spot and help. So if you know what issues can arrive in a patent, when patents are relevant, particularly in the game context, but you know, with everybody that we work with, if you can point out we have an issue here and you know when to get the specialists involved, um, you know, I think you're doing a great service to your clients. So that's about it. If we have any questions, I think we have about five more minutes maybe, something like that. I'm not sure. Ten. Okay. All cool. right. We're doing great on time. So, any <laughs> questions? Yeah. Um, I remember a few years ago uh, seeing a copy of a game called Tiny Tower, and they basically copied the <coughs> play design, but they changed the graphic, so the game looked different, but you know the gameplay is the same. I remember uh, the developer of Tiny Tower. Uh, they always send out an open letter, but they do sue the game. I don't remember they sued me. So is it because the gameplay design, you know, patent is difficult or is hard to protect? Uh, since then, have you guys seen any case about you know protecting gameplay design or suing other company for copying game patent design? Yeah. So the question was about um, basically protections for gameplay design um, and and what sort of recourse there is against companies that kind of copy and reskin games where they're not using the same graphic element but they're really copying all the gameplay elements. Um, so while I can't comment on specifically on the Zynga uh, Tiny Tower case, um, there have been a, a couple recent court cases about the idea of um, copying uh, gameplay and that sort of thing. Um, and it's an interesting area. Uh, patents don't play that much in that space. Um, gameplay patents were, were probably the the victim of the, the whole Alice crisis. We think most of the, most video game patents kind of came back and survived and it's business as usual again. Gameplay patents are probably still in trouble. So, um, you know, an area like that, I think is, is less likely to involve patents. That's almost certainly going to be a copyright issue. Um, and we did see some cases uh, four or five years ago, something like that, um, on, on kind of the gameplay of Tetris and some of the choices that are made there. This is just like that PS Products case. This is one where, hey, this made a lot of intellectual property lawyers really excited for a while, but in the long run, it's just one little bullet point that might be super fact specific. But it does seem like there's a little bit of an emerging trend of actually granting some protection to gameplay, but it's gonna be an uphill battle. It's gonna take a lot of creative lawyering and a lot of money. And so when you hear about these battles, a lot of times, the reason it doesn't come to a lawsuit is because, you know, they get good advice that this is going to be a tough battle. You're going to spend a lot of money, and even if you're right, you're going to spend a lot of money. Um, so unfortunately, sometimes that's how the legal system works. Um, enforcing your rights can, the cost of enforcing your rights can be a big barrier to enforcing your rights. So while I don't know what happened in that particular case, you know, the, that's kind of my thoughts, is that... Line with you. Yeah, I mean, one, one way to think about this, actually, just think about one recent copying instance is, you know, Mario Maker games are very popular. There was someone who came out with a game called Box Maker that's a knockoff, right? And it is very <coughs> damn close. I mean, it's basically everything. The art's been changed a little bit, but it's the same concept. You make the levels, you play through them, et cetera. Everything about this is the same. 
In fact, the way in which it's being taken down has nothing to do with the gameplay, even though it's so similar. It's because they got caught using the sound of the coin pickup. Mm -hmm. It sounds exactly the same. Boom, got him. But in general, if, even though it's, it looks the same, it has like the little cartoon hand when you're hovering over it, everything else is there, you can't do it. You put that even further contrast with like the Fallout Shelter debacle, right? Where the people who made the game Fallout Shelter ended up repurposing some of the code. Even though they'd been hired by Bethesda for the Fallout Shelter, they took some of that code, went to somebody else and made a copy. Some of the code was the same. That's a straight up a copyright infringement. To my knowledge, actually, there's a case on that right now. But it, even there, that one's not really about the gameplay. That's that ended up being about the code. The same developer sort of went to, I believe it was West, or they made the Westworld game, right. and uh, at least the allegations in the lawsuit were that they basically ported over yeah. the code and just made it a a Westworld skin. <laughs> so. Um, you know, in that circumstance, the fact that the games played so similarly was was evidence against the broader assertion right. of kind of you literally Copy. copied our stuff. <laughs> but but the gameplay area is one that's just so interesting from an IP perspective because nothing covers it very cleanly. Um, you know, patents actually would be the one that would cover the idea, the the, the sort of problem there. This idea of I have a concept to my game. And you copied the concept, but changed the expression, changed the art on top. So that's kind of the point of patents versus copyrights. But there's just been a big trend in patents against saying that this, you know, sort of ideas of organizing human behavior is kind of what gameplay rules might be characterized as. You know, that's outside the realm of patents too. So it, it seems to be a little bit of a trend of saying there's frankly no protection for that sort of thing. Um, but you can still get some, you can still build around it, and like I said, there, there's also some hints that courts might begin to grant some copyright protection there. We had a... uh, I guess this may not apply to every one of them, <laughs> since it's mostly lawyers, but as an indie game developer, one of the biggest challenges is cost, and I've heard patents can sometimes be like fifty to $100,000. Uh, are there ways, I guess like one is, is a design patent like a cheaper way to go? And then two, are there ways to like defray some of those costs or like lower them as an indie developer? Yeah, I, there's a few ways to go about this. So I've, I've talked with a lot of startups on this exact topic. So the, first, the answer to your first question with design patents and utility patents, honestly, it depends on what you got. I mean, I wouldn't necessarily make the decision of, oh, I'll go after a design instead of utility. Really, you should be going after the things that you find most important. Um, in some cases, that might not be design. In some cases, that might be. To defray costs, there's a lot of strategies. I mean, there's a variety of ways to do it. The The way of which we've typically recommended people do it is go after what's called a provisional application, is to get your foot in the door. What you do is you file something. Oftentimes, with some of our clients, it's literally been their own notes. That's not, there's some reasons you might not want to do that, but nonetheless, you do it. Uh, and then it buys you a year. And what some of our clients have done is use that year to go shop out money, to go get some investment, get some, get some extra cash on hand. Uh, finding affordable patent lawyers helps. Uh, that One of the things we like to do at our firm is make sure that we have our costs reasonable so we can do that because that way we get work from more fun people. Um, but in general, finding someone who's affordable, there are strategies to take if you just want to get a patent now. Uh, candidly, some of our startup clients have said, look, I need to have something to show investors. That's a different strategy. You can get a big patent. You can make claims that are five pages long, get yourself a patent. Sometimes that's not a good idea, but sometimes you do that. Uh, and then you can spin that off into what we call a continuation, get what you really wanted. There's a lot of ways to do it. There's a lot of configurations. We work with people all day on that, basically, because it is expensive. But you're not wrong. I mean, yes, patents are are more expensive than the other types of intellectual property, but that's because they provide sort of a, a bigger scope of protection, and they're they're protecting something that, you know, a company might have ten thousand copyrights and a thousand trademarks <coughs> and ten patents. Um, so you know, patents are protecting sort of discreetly identified inventions. They're not going to come up in every product, but when you are encountering these sort of unique technical problems, um, that's when you think about patenting. And when you're evaluating kind of the cost of patenting, you need to do what you would do in any business context. Sort of look at what's the potential value here. Um, you know, what's my chance of actually needing this, or or do I get more investors out of it? Do I get you know more market share out of this? Do customers like to see it? Um, sort of evaluating that against the cost, um, you know, fifty to a hundred thousand. Um, that sounds like kind of a real big ballpark. <laughs> um, not everything's going to come in that high, particularly. Um, it depends on what your goals are. Um, I, I, that that would be something I would say. And then as an indie, um, 
the, the government kind of wants small businesses to engage in the business in, in patenting. So they'll cut you a break on all the filing fees too. And, and usually if your attorney knows that you're, um, you know, not looking to spend that much money, um, they, they can work with you. Um, if you're sufficiently technical to be inventing the stuff, you're usually sufficiently technical to explain most of it. Though um, it's always best to kind of have an attorney come in and, and <laughs> sort of it. patentize it. Right. So, yeah. Cool. All right. All right. Um, well, that's our time, but we'll be around at lunch. So right. if there are any other questions, please feel free to reach out. Thanks, guys.